Hey everybody, how's it going? This is Mitt, and I'm here with my co-host Nelson Gomba Comba. Hello. How to be funny in America. This is episode nine, and today we have a lovely guest, Miss Tamagram. She's been doing comedy for eight plus years. She's a producer of a homegrown comedy uh, show that's in Huntsville, Alabama. She's a business consultant, a comedian, a musician, and just an all around talented person and just a really wonderful, amazing person. And my new BFF, <laughs> it's Miss Tamagram. How are you doing? I'm good, how are you guys? So good, so good. Thank you for taking the time, appreciate it. Yeah, I'm very excited to be here. Thanks for welcoming me on, welcoming me on to the show. Yeah, for sure, for sure, yeah. So, um, yeah, so I, I told you guys a little bit about, you know, our, our different segments. Our first segment is kind of just getting to know the guests. And um, so I wanted to know really quickly, like, how did you get into comedy? Yeah, so um, I liked theater and improv when I was in high school and a little bit early on in college. Um, never really did anything with it until about eight and a half years ago when a friend of mine started dating a comedian. And we would all hang out and he was encouraging me to, you know, take my comedic anecdotes from the, the conversations that we had and put it into a set. And so he kind of talked me into doing my first open mic and it was addictive. You know, I, I loved it. It was I did three minutes my first time. The audience laughed and I was like hooked. Do you remember what it was? I actually did a funny poem for my very first um, <laughs> It was because I used to I used to write a lot of poetry. And so it was my way to kind of like still have that comfort, but try something new. Um, I only I, I have done that piece a few times and then um, pretty much I've just switched to, to regular stand up since. That is crazy. Wow. Tell me, I have a question. Yeah. What was your first big laugh? Like, my first big laugh? You remember it? Uh, I, I, I would say I do remember it. Um, and it was about a dick joke. A dick joke? <laughs> <laughs> Basically, yeah, that's kind of, <laughs> that's kind of how it all got started. <laughs> it all started with the hey. dick joke, wasn't it? All it all started with a dick joke, yep. <laughs> I feel like dick jokes produce the most, um, the, I, I, I wouldn't say they're the easiest <laughs> material or low hanging fruit, if you part of the pun, but. Hey, low hanging fruit, mm, depends I, on the person. <laughs> tiny fruit. <laughs> one of my first, one of my first um, jokes when I started, I used to say, my name is Nelson Tanashi Koba Koba Julia the second. That's the shortest thing about me. And like <laughs> people laughed. I was like, oh geez. This is uh, what I'm doing right now. So yeah, I started That is a funny joke. A funny dig joke. That's how we started. That's how we <laughs> Isn't that how you started your second special too? What do you mean you, you... <laughs> I would never drop that joke? <laughs> <laughs> It is but a yeah. Joke, for sure. yeah, I so, love making dick jokes though, but, but yeah, there's a time and a place for them. I don't make as many anymore. After a while, you start removing them from your set <laughs> because there was a point when like, um, you know, some grown ups start showing up. Like I'm a grown up too, but you know, like- people, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't- The grown up grown ups that are like, like quit being a kid, you, yeah. I was like, hey man, I gotta start talking about other things besides this. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a step in a comedian's journey that we all have to go through. Yes, yeah. I've definitely been making a change more um, towards more intellectual jokes and um, current events, political, and just philosophical too, I would say. Yeah. I'm, I wanna make my comedy I, I want to make people laugh, but I also want to make people think. I want to make people have feelings about something and, and have kind of light bulb moments about life. If I can bring them to that, then I'm doing my job. That is good. That's um, that's similar to an approach that I've, I've started to adopt myself. I've even started reading up on 
on just books about life and drama because I've realized that the truth, like the things that we call the truth, those universal truths, if they are presented in a funny way, they can carry so much weight, just like a comedian who's also giving philosophical points that give those light bulbs moment. You go from just being aha funny to giving people barely laughs and that's, that's some good, that's a good direction to take. That's a- well, and as we've found out after being in the Right 10 Club for how long, you can literally make a joke about anything. Oh yeah, absolutely. Anything could be made funny. You just have to put the right spin on it. 100%. I, I went through a process where I realized that I could joke about everything after spending years trying to write jokes. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> Instead of looking for the funny part, let me just look for just things that are happening in life and I'll make them funny as opposed to trying to scratch it. I just try to, we call it scraping the barrel here. I don't know. <laughs> Instead of constantly pacing for like, something funny, taking a moment back, just observing life and then making what you observe funny. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, so this is an interesting thing because we're ta- as we talk about the comic journey, like the first part is really just scraping the barrel, as you say, and making dick jokes, making self-deprecating jokes, that kind of thing. You know, and then you start to like learn how to, um, learn how to write jokes. So you can now talk about whatever you want to. Um, and, you know, Tam and I talked a little bit about, um, you know, finding your voice and that's like a big milestone in uh, a comics journey. And Tam, can you kind of like walk us through, like y- you had an interesting kind of perspective about like you do characters and, you know, you've kind of found your voice. So I wanted to see. Yeah. So first of all, people would tell me uh, when I was a new comic, like, don't worry, you'll find your voice one day. And I didn't really know what that meant, but I knew that I wasn't as authentic on stage as I wanted to be. And I looked for ways to build a character that I would go on stage and use. Um, I tried it a couple different ways and sometimes it was funny and sometimes it was, it was not funny. And then I kind of started doing different characters based on my emotions. Um, I joke about being a bipolar Gemini which both of those things are true. Um, but I joke about having multiple personalities on stage. And so I've kind of like leaned into that a little bit and, and used it as a way to become more comfortable with displaying emotion. But then even further along on the journey, I realized finding your comedic voice is truly just being yourself and stepping into that fully and just being like the boldened, uh, more exaggerated, funny version of you in whatever scenario it is and bringing that emotion behind it, you know, whether you're pissed off or whether you're confused or whether you're sad, you can still make those things funny. There are ironies everywhere. Interesting. So, um, go ahead. Or I, I just want to say, um, it's interesting when you say finding yourself because that's something that a comedian has to do. I mean, not all artists need to find their voice. A saxophonist or like a pianist may not necessarily have to find the voice, but as a comedian, you have to find your voice. And I feel like that's what makes our journey different from other types of professions because you have to be comfortable being who you really see yourself as, as opposed to selling yourself short. And it's like, it's one of those things that require you just peeling off all these layers outside and just revealing that that true inner you, how you see yourself on stage, how you think your biggest fan sees you, that getting to that level, that's like that stripping of all the impurities. And that's like that that's something that makes the stand-up journey unique, I think. And uh, I like that's what I like about it. It is really unique. I agree. And, you know, at first we have, we get caught up in the mindset of we want to present ourselves a certain way on stage, but that may not really be true to ourselves because I'm multifaceted. You know, I I can try to present only this certain part of me on stage, but that that's leaving a lot that people won't get to see if I do it that way. So you have to embrace all of you, even the dark side, even the things that 
you know, are a little bit fearful. You got to, you got to work with those too, because they are a part of you. That is true. Well, getting tactical about that. How do you find those parts of you? Like you find that dark part or that sad part? Like, is it more you're journaling every single day and just noting things? Um, or is it, are you asking people like, hey, what do you think of me, right? Like what, what is the tactical thing that you're doing? Well, for me, I do a lot of self-reflection and, and I do journaling. Um, I take notes on my phone. Sometimes I record my thoughts on a, like an audio recorder and then I'll listen back to it and, and try to use that as a way to, it's like a go from a free flow to like, now I can make these into jokes or maybe not jokes, but maybe I also write other things that aren't funny, but maybe it can be turned into like a serious blog post or something. There's always content that comes out of it though. That's useful. Um, I think you probably could ask your friends and your family, like, you know, tell me what you think a big character flaw is for me because I want to write about it. Well, you know, you're kind of setting yourself up to get your feelings hurt there. So be careful. I don't know if everybody can really handle that kind of pressure. Um, but I did have, I did do an exercise like that one time. How did they go? It hurt my feelings. Oh. <laughs> I learned things about myself that I was like, oh, what? Really? You think I sound like that? <laughs> like, for example, one of them was I sound condescending oh. and sound like a know-it-all. And I was like, <laughs> first I wanted to be defensive, but then I was like, you know what? I can put myself in your shoes and I can see how you, you could see me that way. Yeah. That's not what I want to come across as, but I can see how you, I could be con kind of coming across that way. And, and there's a lot of value in that. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. It's embracing like who you really are. You're like, listen, man, I accept that I'm going to come off as like, you know, it all, but I'm okay with that. It's being okay with that. That turns you into like that comedian that you want to be, you know? Well, it gives you something to write about because I can write a whole bunch of jokes about being a know-it-all. Yeah. You know? I, I, I think I'm going to need to try this exercise as well. 50 character flaws. 50 character flaws? I can even Just, answer I'll ask my Facebook followers. <laughs> hey, guys. But what you can do it with... <laughs> you can do it with strengths, too. Yeah. Ask people what your strengths are. Yeah. Nah, strengths are overrated, man. Strengths are overrated. We like the flows. <laughs> well, if you wanted to do a global thing, so, um, you know, there's a personal branding exercise. And actually, if you're branding in anything, whether it's business or personal, um, there's a thing called SWOT, right? Um, a SWOT mm -hmm. analysis, right? Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Um, it's a very simple kind of grid. Um, and it has four squares, you know, and you put SWOT. And you can just hand that to someone and be like, hey, what are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? You know, what are, what are some things that I can work on that'd be opportunities? And then what are threats? Like things that are like, you should stop doing that right, right now. <laughs> <laughs> and if you give that to like a hundred people, you'll probably find, you know, things that you didn't know about yourself at all, you know? And that's something that I've been trying to work up the courage to do. Um, you know, as Tam said, it's like, uh, maybe you don't want to know some of this stuff, you know, but. Um, there but, were things that I was like, I was shocked. <laughs> but, but they were all valid. They were all valid. I couldn't, you know, you can't argue with how people feel. What, what I like about that exercise is I feel like it forces you to defend yourself at some point. You're like, wait a minute. I'm not that bad. All these things. <laughs> I get it. I get it that, okay, I do X, Y, Z, but. It doesn't mean I'm a bad guy. It just means I'm mm -hmm. this and that. So yeah. Well, it I, made me more mindful about how my behavior came across. So then I was able to think about, you know, going forward, try not to come across that way if that's not my intent. And it's not only behavior, right? It's actually before you even open your mouth, people assume a lot of things about you, right? Just say, <laughs> yeah, exactly. A great example is Ryan Hamilton. I don't know if you've seen Happy Face yet. Have you seen this special on Netflix? Oh, such a great special. Um, this dude, I think, opens for Jerry Seinfeld sometimes. Um, his name is Ryan Hamilton. He's a dude from Idaho, but he has, like, just resting happy face, you know? But he's, like, a depressed, just, like, person inside. 
so he makes like a ton of jokes in the beginning about that he's like just because I look this way doesn't mean I think this way and it's really funny he bases like his whole character on that and it's just a brilliant way and an example of like being aware of like how you come off as a person you know and he created I come across I have RBF pretty yeah. bad and um I try to be very mindful about it like the fact that I'm on camera with you guys and I can see myself helps because that I can look at myself and see okay you look like you're being uh cranky so fix your face <laughs> but it, I went my I went without knowing that for 10 years in my career yeah totally. and I would be in meetings and people could see my face and I didn't know how was it coming how I was coming across until I did that exercise and people told me that I look mean in meetings all the time this is like a consistent thing that people told me and I was like okay well I'm gonna have to do something about my face then because I don't want to come across as a mean old bitch in a cop you know in a meeting I'm not trying that's my thinking face yeah You're just thinking <laughs> did you ever overcorrect? you're just like this is a creepy smile girl now so now I'm like <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can overcorrect. <laughs> well, I feel like with, with this exercise that can inspire a lot of um, the audience that we're trying to build. So a uh, part of the exercise or part of these exercises that we do is uh, we want people or up and coming comedians from anywhere in the world that despite how different our journeys are, there are so many similarities that like bring us all together. So this exercise is definitely one that I would recommend. I mean, we, with the character flows, right? It, the way I see myself, right? Um, I think it's easy for people to think that I can come off as cocky, arrogant, and all that. But what they don't know is that I've had to work through a lot of things <laughs> to get to like, where I have so yeah that's like it's 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 interesting seeing how other people see you but then they could be wrong as well you know so that's the approach that I would take like I know I come across as this and that but... <laughs> why do you like, work so hard? Huh? is that how you do stand up all the time no, no, it's my, my, comedy <laughs> my comedy voice is not my normal voice <laughs> Yeah, how <laughs> your whole TED talk like that. I should have been funny. <laughs> but yeah, so um, I feel like just doing that exercise alone would initiate so many questions that can um inspire good premises about digging deep within oneself, you know, to a point where you can get some good material out of that. So thank well, you. and if you're if you're looking for that kind of thing, I mean, another thing that I do when I'm like, I, I really want to write something new, yeah. um, but I can't, like, nothing's coming to mind, you know, um, what I'll do is I'll go think about, like, um, and I got this from therapy, but think about an emotion, pick one. So let's say, think about a time when you were very, very scared. And then, okay, well, give me some examples in your mind. Okay, well, one, one time I was really, really scared when I almost drowned when I was kayaking. One time I was really, really scared when I almost drowned surfing. One time I was really, really scared one time when I almost drowned on the river. Well, there's a theme here. Clearly, I need to stay the hell out of these bodies of water, yeah. you know, like, but you just start to uncover things and, and you might find patterns. And then that leads to another whole type of joke that you really wouldn't think of and and then you can talk talk about each of those stories and, and the funny parts of surviving those things. Well, and just pick any emotion and do that. One time this girl told me her period was late. I was scared. The one time this girl told me she was keeping the baby, I was scared. Time, <laughs> I guess I really should stay away from women. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, but, <clears throat> That is somehow how you would get to that theme. And that's a good one, man. That's, For sure. Think of all the times of beats. <laughs> I like Yeah, that. so just pick an emotion, any of them. I mean, I have um uh, I have like this little cheat sheet thing that's got all of the emotions on it. And um it's like a hundred of them listed. It's obviously not all emotions, but it's like a huge, pretty good list to start from. And you can just pick one and go, okay, <laughs> let me think about a, a time when I felt loathing um, for someone you know yeah. any emotion 
and, and just to add to that as well, actors do a similar exercise as well, because when they need to recreate an emotion, they need to get to the truth of the moment. And if you've done acting, which both of you may have, you, you may be familiar with that. If you want to recreate an emotion on stage, you have to channel in like a similar experience yep. in some instances. So yeah, that's uh, acting, comedy, all of that that's linked together. That's something that definitely try out. Sometimes. Well, and I'll take it a little further for you. It's almost like therapy too. Because if you do revisit these things where you may have had some kind of trauma or so one one I did was think about a time when you felt very rejected. Yeah. And so I did and I wrote a couple of jokes about it. Um, but it also allowed me to kind of work through some of these issues that I hadn't really thought about for a long time, but they may have still had some pain associated with them. And I was able to let go. Of them. Wow. Dear, while, while you wrote a joke about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's like therapy. This yeah. is good. Um, <clears throat> Tammy, I have to say uh, thank you very much for just opening the session with like such a strong, so, such, a, so, 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 such a good exercise and all these things that I feel like new up and coming comedians and even those that have been doing it for years can apply because at the end of the day, it's about just taking yourself to the next level and the deeper you dig into comedy, you the, the more you learn about yourself. And with these sort of exercises and, you know, therapy, like you're saying, oof, that's, that's a lot of people you can end up helping with these exercises. <laughs> people end up revealing that they're true people just because they want to do a five minute set. They're like, hey man, I just wanted to write jokes, but now I'm a better person in it. <laughs> yep. What would a bunch of well-adjusted comedians even look like? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that's no, that's the crazy cool. part is, um, <clears throat> like we were talking about the comedic journey, right? Like a lot of comedians just start self-deprecating right in the beginning. You know, it's like dick jokes and then self-deprecating. Um, and you can kind of tell the people that are just like, are not even having fun up there. They're just kind of making fun of themselves, right? And then there's a self-deprecating once you get past that point where it's like, okay, they're laughing at me, but I'm okay with it. And then you're just like, oh, now I'm with you, right? Um, when I first started that, you know, that's how I was in the beginning was I was just like super self-deprecating. And um, I got this feedback from um, one of my friends and they were like, are you okay? Like, are you, you know, like, I was like, yeah, I'm just making jokes. You know, I was like totally not aware of it at all. And the funny part was I actually had a girl, I invited a girl that I really, really liked to my first comedy show, you know? And um, I just thought, oh, I'm gonna impress her, blah, blah, blah. But I apparently put like my whole life on the table. <laughs> like wow you have problems i'm gonna leave now and she ran she was like no man you got too many issues <laughs> well I, this this one time i was doing like a show in london right then i was talking about just you know i, I wouldn't say they're bad jokes because they were funny but they were quite racial and then this this black guy this old black man just comes at me and like he had that that aura of like that black uncle who's like, you know, when you're watching a movie and like there's a guy that comes in and tells the main guy where he's going wrong and where he needs to fix it. So yeah. <laughs> I, I was on stage, I did a show, I was telling jokes, blah, 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 blah. People were laughing, doing all sorts. But when I left the stage, man, this guy just comes in, he's like, hey man, I was laughing, but like, listen, man, like, I don't know how to put it, but like, uh, you don't need to say all oh, this shit and like, <laughs> <laughs> maybe just sit there, man. Yo, yo, you're the person that I was trying to impress here. <laughs> it's like you've seen past the mask, past the old. So my point is, it's just like, you know, it, it's crazy. The, the, their feedback, you know, sometimes you're not ready for it, but it is needed. Well, one thing to keep in mind is we don't want the audience to feel sorry for us because as soon as they do, then it's not funny anymore. Yeah. So I don't ever want to hear 
the response to a joke be, oh, yeah. And I have, I have, because I have a few jokes about my childhood. I had a really crappy childhood. My parents were on drugs. My mom, you know, was a teenager. And there's just a lot of stuff that I went through that made me who I am today. And so I do want to joke about it. But when I do, I have people come up to me and they're like, sweetie, are you okay? Because you, it sounds like you might still need to work through some of that. <laughs> like, that's what I'm doing here. Can't you tell? <laughs> yeah. I, feel like, I feel like what you just say, Tammy, is a very, you know, that, that's a very good point. And um, that's, that, that can lead us onto another topic, like the importance of premises. Because when I, when I'm thinking about premises or like how to set up a joke, it's very important that you get the energy, right? Because the first line of that joke is going to determine how they feel about you. So even though you're telling a story that is sad, if you preface it with something like, listen, man, I don't want you guys to feel sorry for me because you know, the, those little lines that make people realize, okay, it's just a joke. You don't need to, to come up to him after the set and pet him on the shoulder and be like, hey man, call this number here. You know, like, <laughs> you know, so I feel like if you set your joke up or premise up in a way where you make it clear to the audience that listen, man, this is a sad story, but I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm okay. Because it's, it's important for the energy in the room to be, uh, it's important for everyone to be on the same page, basically. You know, if if it's a funny story, you want everyone to be laughing. You don't want one person in the in the house to be like, man, that's actually really sad. <laughs> or you have to finish the story out with a triumphant um, ending. So so they, they were sad for a minute, but then they see you have a win and now you're OK. And you have to take them through that whole journey. Otherwise, you'll leave them feeling sorry for you. And, and you definitely don't want that. That's true. You want them to cheer you on or like root you on to do better or something but, you but don't feeling <laughs> you don't want it you can have like i kind of want people to feel sorry for me for a second but only until i get to the punch you don't yeah. want them to leave feeling sorry for you like oh man this poor guy he needs therapy and like a hug <laughs> <laughs> like this is a comedy show not a ted talk you know what I'm <laughs> <laughs> all right so are you ready to go on to the jokes sure yes let's do it so, um, shall we start with the 50 Shades of Grey joke? Sure. That was good. Okay, let me okay. tell you. Something. Let's set up the segment. So the segment is um, kind of like the, for our comedy nerds, right? So we usually take one-liners or bits or premises and ask the comedian how they came up with the joke, ask about the writing process and any other kind of nerdy things we can think of. So um go ahead so 50 shades um the joke is about 50 shades resulting in er visits um because when you know when the first movie came out er related sex accidents shot up 600 percent oh. i have a friend who works in the er as a doctor in texas and she keeps me informed on a lot of things and so i just when she told me that factoid i was like i have to write a joke about that because that's just crazy what are you people doing this is this is not a how to guide like what you need to you need to know what you're working with here before yeah. you try to get into the whips and chains and stuff like you it's not for amateurs. <laughs> <laughs> I, I genuinely like that I, I was laughing in my room and I was just thinking right like you know when you when you approaching topics like that topics like 50 shades of gray something that's in the general population something that a lot of people are talking about. How do you decide which angle to take? And the reason I ask is, like, Tammy, I'm sure you'll be performing with loads of comics on one night, and there's, there's times when another comic will have an, the same topic, but they go in a different direction, you know? So my point is, you know, like, how did you decide which direction to go? Did you just decide, I should write a Fifty Shades of Grey, but then it just played out how it played out, or? Well, really, it was it was my friend telling me about some things that she had recently experienced in the ER, and um, she didn't mention Fifty Shades of Grey. I did. I was like, "What is this Fifty Shades of Grey? What are these people doing?" 
And so that that's where I kind of got the idea is, is making that connection that this could truly be a result of these movies that like all these all these horny people out here are now like super excited to try new things, which that's great. I'm glad you're excited to try new things, but you need to have safe words. You need to have proper parameters. And the one story that I ended up putting into the joke was about a man who came to the ER with a toy car up his booty because they were getting, they were doing some kind of role playing and it just, it went in too far. And like, what, how did you get here? (laughs) What, how is that your kink? (laughs) How does it get to that point? Yes. How? So I, I, I made the connection between 50 shades because it was topical really is what I was doing. Got it. Okay. So basically your strategy was you were talking to your friend and some quip came up in your mind and you're like, okay, I'm going to connect these two somehow. Yeah. So you're making a false premise seems like about 50 shades of gray equals uh, increase ER visits. Right. And then you are explaining, well, I guess, how do you get to like the next part of that joke then? So I switch into kind of a um, act out where I'm pretending to be the wife of, you know, you're in the ER and you see, you see this man that won't sit down. He's like pacing. He looks very uncomfortable. And the wife tells the nurse, he doesn't want to sit down. He, he can't, he actually, he has a toy in his ass. <laughs> So then we kind of go from there. It's like, well, how did this happen? Did you, whose, ta- whose car is this? Is this your son's car? Did you think you were just going to sneak it back into his collection when he was asleep? And like, he would never know that, that the car got used in that manner because I'm pretty sure that's how you get pink eye, <laughs> you know? And so I just use a lot of, um, a, a lot of different comedic tools to make it crazy. And then I end up with an act out. Um, and then I switch to narrating again at the end. And it's like, well, guys, there's some lessons here. For one, women do like cars, but we suck at parking. That's the best. Yeah, wow. <laughs> that, that's a good joke. That <laughs> I, how, like, so I'm sorry. One more question about that. Super sure. um, so that last line, was that something that you came up with and you were like, I need to put it somewhere? And you were like, no, it's the best line. It's going to go at the end. Or did it just kind of culminate into that? It's interesting you say that. So I tend to start out all my joke writing in a similar manner. I usually write a one, one liner and then I try to turn it into like a three liner. And then I try to turn it into a more of a, like a 30 second to 45 second bit. And I do that by adding tags and coming up with other angles to put in there. And then I try to figure out the best order to build up the story and then leave with the right feeling that I want people to leave with. And so we start out with, you know, we feel bad and then we're laughing and then we walk away with a with a sense of dignity of like, well, we're not that stupid. Um, And then we we leave them laughing at the absurdity of, well, everybody knows women can't drive. It's a stereotype. Uh, I love how um, even though, you know, we're all different and all that, the development stages of a joke are similar like when the audience hears it, it's like, oh God, how did you come up with that? Well, I could be it. But what they don't know is a lot of this stuff starts off as like one-liners or like a comment from your friend and you're like, damn, that's funny. Then you think about yep. it for two days, then they become two lines, then it becomes a, a small argument. And then an act out comes in and then boom, the joke starts developing. In a few months later, you get like two, three minutes of just one topic. It is, it's fascinating, I love it. So what I sent you, um, that was just one, I mean, that was just a snippet from one show and I have done different tags and I have other things that I, I don't always use. It just kind of depends on how the conversation naturally develops. Like I have punches written down, like bullet point punches of like, I know I want to hit these things, but how it comes out might change a little bit depending on how the audience is going. And you guys know, like depending on how the audience is reacting, you may cut a joke short or you may add to it or even improv while you're on the stage. So um, <clears throat> when, when I did, um, I, 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 well, 
I have a joke on the topic as well, but it's, it's completely different because the way I did my Fifty Shades of Grey joke was that I was looking for topics to write jokes about. And at that point, Fifty Shades is like a hot topic. So I thought, ha, I need to write a joke about Fifty Shades of Grey, but what should I talk about? Then also in the news at that point was Toffee as a Slave. And I was like, there, there's the link. So my joke is basically, it started off with that connection and then I worked out how to get from point A to point B and then later on, years later, I'm still using that joke because it does get laughs and we hate to throw away a good joke. <laughs> you know, so. Well, and it's still topical. People know that both of those movies at this point still, you, you know, maybe 10, 15 years from now, you'll have to, maybe there will be something else you can change it to. That's another thing. I take old jokes and change them to where they may have been topical at the time, by saying something but now i can make it fresh if you will and still yeah. use that same joke but it's got a little bit updated language that's more topical for today so you probably keep using that joke forever if you can continue to evolve it a joke is like it's like something you can build you know you can take off the head one year put a different head but the body is still <clears throat> It's still there. Yeah. Sometimes I've been watching now. Sometimes I watch like old stand up comedy from like, uh, let's say even the 80s or like some Richard Pryor stuff. Even though some of the references are outdated, you can just think, oh, damn, if he did that right now, that would just be funny. He might just need to change this and that. But still, mm -hmm. like, the funny part of the, it never goes away. Well, that's, that's important that you say that because what we do, I, I, my best friend is a marketing and sales guru. So she talks to me about, you want to create evergreen content that still holds its value 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 50 years from now. And Richard Pryor is a good example of that. His stuff is still funny today. There are some comics that we look at from the seventies and eighties and go, Ooh, no, that, that would not work at all today. Holy crap. But Richard Pryor, he was creating that evergreen content that will always be funny. And that's what we want to create for ourselves because that's the stuff that lasts. So how do you, how do you create evergreen content? I mean, it's probably a very complicated question, but. Um, you have to just think of it as stuff that's timeless that can apply um, to both past, present and future. And, and I feel like um, with, with, with that sort of approach as well, you have to, to remove all the, you know, bullshit, like, and that's just for lack of a better word. And the reason I say that is because if you want to create something that is going to be relevant in years time, then you have to really think about the audience as well. Like these topics that I'm talking about, are people always going to find them funny? Is there controversy in this? Um, what's the likelihood of like the world changing their opinion on such subjects? Because that has happened stuff, I don't need to tell you guys, stuff that was funny maybe in the early noughties was not as funny 10 years later or five years later. And you could just see like how sometimes just thinking about the audience and how people perceive you, all of that can affect the language you use, the references you use, the, you know, all these little things. When I think, of, I think. It, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I was just saying. When I think of um, evergreen content, I always go back to Chris Rock. I mean, his gun bit works today. His scorpion yep. bit works. Like everything that he has, women, right? Everything. It's just like you Ooh. can watch it today, and it's still the same issues that we're facing in America. You know. Because what does he talk about? He talks about things that everybody can relate to, regardless of your age, regardless of your class, your race. That is evergreen. And I would think of George Carlin, because George Carlin, you can go back and watch his bits from the 70s, yeah. and they are still just as valid today. Well, that makes sense. I've written that down, because that's those are the type of guys that I'm trying to be like. Evergreen. Yeah, yeah evergreen, yeah. And that's a marketing and sales term that that refers to being able to create content and make money off of it from now until perpetuity so it's not like something that's only going to provide value for today and i'm just applying it to comedy but i think it's a marketing term 
comedy is just as much about marketing as mm -hmm. it, it's a very important aspect of you because you are in a way you're selling yourself you yeah i'm so sorry tammy i am so inspired this is such a <laughs> i get so excited talking about comedy like this is part of what me and me are trying to do <clears throat> is we're trying to create just a genuine conversation like um when a lot of people do podcasts right sometimes it gets too technical sometimes it gets too much of one thing but it's very important that we just also show that we're not just like comedians it's like we're trying to relate to everyone we're people you who you are um, you know but this thing brings us together so all this talk about everyone can relate to this like what you just said about George Carlin, let's stop that. Like, I just get excited because I know next time I'm sitting down writing jokes. Adding those little lines can just affect how I write a premise, how I, or which punchline I choose to go with, all of that stuff. So, to all our viewers out there, this is why you should listen. Anyway, carry on. <laughs> Shameless plug in the middle of the I don't care, bro. That's who we are, right? Yeah. Um, wow, no, I didn't anticipate that we were going to take this long on a couple different subjects. So, Tam, if it's okay, we'll switch to the uh, yeah. the troubleshooting segment, which is yes. uh, super fun. Um, so, Tam sent me a Kroger Candy Crush joke. Can you tell about that? Yeah, so um, I shop at Kroger a lot. It's really close to my house and I use the self checkout because I want to avoid people. And when I go to pay, I put my card in and it plays this like sound like the game Candy Crush when my card goes through and it's like ding, 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 woo, woo. No, you are taking money out of my bank account and you're trying to trick me into pretending that I just won something. Hell no. That sound needs to be changed to more of like a woo, woo, woo. <laughs> like I don't want it to sound like a dwindling bank account because that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it is just a premise right now I've been playing around with. Um, I haven't done it on stage yet. I've just kind of like wrote some notes. What I wrote you sent to you was just kind of my thoughts on it. Yeah. You know, Tammy, well, when when Meet uh, sent me that joke, right? We just started <laughs> laughing and like um I was like, okay, so this is one thing she can do, right? Um find an, an inappropriate situation for that sound. So like an abortion or so. Okay, and I hate using that word, but the thing <laughs> is, we're talking about an inappropriate situation where you have that happy sound. It's like, and that was one of the few things that would be a bit could come <laughs> up. Yeah, but yes. I'm sure you can come up with other awkward situations <laughs> where like, that song just makes you think, wait a minute, this is not a happy moment, sir. <laughs> you know, why are you playing such happy music? <laughs> and where my mind went with that, because mm. in the genre of games, I thought Sonic the Hedgehog, because you're talking about oh. dwindling your bank account. So yes. like, that sound when he gets hit and all the coins fall out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's right. where I went with that. Um, and I, I thought of it more of a story like so you're complaining about it you tell the manager the manager changes it to something even worse you know ah, i love that <laughs> see we went no, i'm like begging for it to go but just please give me that back i'd right. rather hear that <laughs> we went for two Maybe. different directions here i went for like a really dark one <laughs> <sighs> So I was thinking, what would be worse? The sound of the cops? Woo, woo. Like, oh, shit. Like, why would you do? No, put it back. I'd rather listen to Candy Crush and have you trick me into thinking you're doing me a favor by taking my money. Then you feel like I'm about to be arrested every time I'm about to. Well, that's the one I went to, but I thought robbery. Like, put your hands up. You know, like. Oh, stop. Put your hands up. Oh, God. Yeah, there. I like that angle, though, Mint. I do. Um, and I also, I like the angle, I like the angle Nelson brought up about coming up with other inappropriate uses. Like if we're going to use that, it's like, come on, man, you know, are we going to use that in a, in a situation where an abortion that that's pretty dark. I don't know that I would use that because it is pretty dark. Um, 
or this might be on brand for you too. Um, instead of going negative, you can go positive. Like, okay, the manager actually did something for me. He created positive affirmations, right? So you're beautiful, you're courageous. You don't have much money, but you're amazing, right? <laughs> So it switches to words and it's just a recording. And that's like, you're broke, but you're beautiful. You're right. That's it. <laughs> that <is> uh. <laughs> See, that segment of the show initiates so many angles to your end. Like, one thing that I've just been thinking about is just like the wrong topics, you know? Like, sometimes there's topics on stage that you say that people are like, God damn, oof, Nelson, man, what are you talking about? Yep. But yeah. I felt like in as far as inappropriate situations go, you don't have to say that, trust me, Daddy. I, I, I just couldn't think of anything where an episode like that would be appropriate. And that was the only thing that I could think about. So to all our followers that I have offended, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of divorce, so I'm divorced. Um, <clears throat> and it just made me think of like, when I get my when I got my divorce papers, that would have been the apt time. Like, can we rig that up so that when people get their divorce papers delivered to their like, there's something that opens in a card and makes a noise when you open it in the mail, or if you get the email, like when you open it, it's it, it tells you something. <laughs> Congratulations, you're free! Woo! And, and after that email, there'll be a pop up in the corner that says, "There's local." Singles in your area looking to date you. <laughs> it just goes right into a dating app. That's hilarious. Uh, hey. yeah, actually, looking at the words itself, like you can, you can uh, dive into a lot of stuff. Like Kroger is an interesting place to shop, right? Over a lot of other places. I, I guess here it's not really that popular in Chicago. You know, we have like. Mm. Whatever. So why do you pick Kroger over anything else? Um, yeah, it's closest to my house. <laughs> <laughs> That's literally why it's laziness. Yeah. <laughs> Fun. I could walk there in a pinch, but I won't because I'm lazy, but I could. Well, um, that's 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 uh that's just an example of different directions you can take a premise and that did catch us unaware. And the thing about these exercises is, you know, people can just see how our minds work in the moment and um, a discussion between comedians, looking at the different angles a joke could take. In a few years time, someone might see you performing this joke and it's like, got a completely different direction. That's, yep. that's just the beauty of it. So um, just to wrap up, Tammy, is a entertainment as you are uh, on your Zoom. Just want I go by many names, Nelson. I go by many names: Tammy, <laughs> Tamara, Tamika, the Taminator. The Taminator. Like I said, I'm a Gemini with bipolar disorder and OCD. We we play games. You spin the wheel. Which personality is going to come out? It really kind of depends on my mood, and um, you know. You know this. <laughs> This old podcast I'm calling you Tammy, so I'm happy I don't have to apologize or edit. <laughs> it's a valid name for me. It's one of the names I go by. So yes, yeah, totally Tammy valid. Tammy too. Ah, <laughs> uh, only one Tammy. There's Tammy, Tamara, Tamika, the Taminator, Tam Tam, T Buck, T Baby, T Buck. I love that. T Buck. So my last name is Bucky. So T Buck. Yeah. <laughs> that's, 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 that should be a rough name. <laughs> No, Tamagram is my rap name. Because okay. it sounds like a message, you know, like. Yeah. <laughs> Tamagram. Um, Tamagram, is there anything that you'd like to share with us before you go, like where our followers can find you? Because it will tag you in, in all these things. But if there's anything else extra that you want people to um, look into. You know. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. So you can find me on Facebook, Ask Tamagram. Um, I have a website as well. It's asktamagram.com. Um, we will be, I will be hosting homegrown comedy for the showcase in March. So that's March 12th, Friday, um, here in Huntsville and tickets are $5 for five comedians, which is a super good deal. And in April, 
I'm going to be <coughs> performing on a comedy showcase fundraiser here in Huntsville. That is something that we are doing. Um, it's actually to support a political action committee that myself and some other entertainers have founded recently. And we are looking to just take action here as much as we can in our neighborhoods, in our states, and um, have, have some kind of positive change. So I look forward to both of those events. If anybody is in the Huntsville, Alabama area and wants to attend, please hit me up. I will send you the link so that you can get tickets. Cool. This Thank has been you. such an enjoyable episode, Tammy. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me, guys. Thank you. Uh, peace out. <laughs> That's